I was able to take a trip yesterday to Yosemite. It's been a while since I've been up there. It's only actually my second trip. And I got to tell you, I love it. If you, if you all been up there to, to Yosemite, I'm assuming a good chunk of you have probably been there. I forgot how much I loved being out just, just out in God's country, right, and, and seeing these amazing things that he does. The, the thing about Yosemite that makes it spectacular is just those giant rocks, right, these just huge masses that make you feel so teeny. And you look at, you look at the walls, and if you look at them long enough, you start to see little specks that move, and you realize those are people like trying to scale this wall. And, and it overwhelms me every time. First off, I don't do heights, so just looking up at that gives me just this this anxious overwhelmingness. But I love being there anyway because I also love that, that feeling. I love that feeling of being overwhelmed by nature, of realizing that there is so many, so much more to creation than just me and my world. And I love being in those areas. Um, to be fair, you don't get to be alone when you go out to Yosemite, right? Every, every tourist that they'll allow in comes in there, including myself, right? I'm a tourist when I go there. But I wonder how many times we've taken the time to just go out and be alone somewhere and just walk in nature and realize that this is something that God has created in his beauty. That, that inside of these giant, huge masses of rock, that there are these teeny molecules, some of which that have been there for so long, that have never experienced the air that we breathe or seen that. And, and even that, is, as grand as it is, it's small when you compare it to, to the planet itself. It's small when you compare that to, to, the, to the universe, to all these things, right? Everything scales. And I really believe that the beauty of the Lord can be seen in all that, that he wants us to say, look, I did all of this for you. Every little detail that we may never even pay attention to or notice because nobody notices that one little rock inside of that giant rock. Nobody notices or thinks about that one leaf on the back of that tree in an area that nobody can get to or that one plant that's growing in a crevice, hanging on by dear life, but that no person will probably ever see but it still exists because God is so amazing and faithful to creation and the intricacies of it. He works even when we don't notice and even when we'll never notice. And, and so here we, here we are in this church and I look at it, this community and sometimes I'll be honest with you, I get overwhelmed by ministry. I get overwhelmed because the one person when I come to the church that I see asleep in front of the doors and nobody's here so I let him in I let him sleep in the back I give him a cup of coffee and I send him on his way and I know that there's nothing else that I can do for this person and I'm left feeling if I can't even help this one person if I can't change a life for one person then what, what can I possibly do for this church what can I possibly do for this community. And then I find comfort because I realize it was never up to me anyway. That it's not that, that God's going to just do what God does and, and we're, we're just along for the ride, but rather that we're supposed to just do what it is that we're to do. To open that door and to let someone in to offer a cup of coffee, a place for someone to lay down on a couch, to let somebody use the bathroom to brush their teeth, and to just pray for them and beg them to be safe as they go through their life. And that small part, that one small thing that seems so insignificant is nothing more than one atom in that huge, massive rock that may never be seen by anybody in the universe. 
but it is as important as every other bit of it to what it is. And I say that because I know that all of us get overwhelmed. All of us can look in this world and say, look, I'm going to come to church, I'm going to do my thing, but it's not, it doesn't seem to be doing anything. I just, I want to encourage you to tell you that it does. That it may seem insignificant to be one atom amongst this huge mass, to recognize that the God of the universe holds all of that in his hand and every bit of it matters to him. And so those atoms that you hold up around you, those people, your neighbors, that matters. Turn turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. We're going to begin in verse 26. Would you, would you rise to your feet as we read the word of the Lord together? I'm not giving you a whole lot of time to turn there, but I rambled a lot, so we probably need to get on with it. Beginning in verse 26. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official from, of, the, of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And he asked him, do you understand what you're reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shear, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak and started with this scripture. scripture, He proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down to the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So I've been wrestling with this passage for the last, um, last week or so. And it really, it really wasn't until yesterday, until um, I was walking through that kind of felt the direction I think might be, might be best for us for where we're at. And it's just to kind of imagine ourselves as a part of the story. And that's what we do as pastors. We, we, we find a passage, we find an idea in this passage, something that we're supposed to do, a lesson, right, that we've pulled from the passage, and then we focus on that and try to explain from the passage what this means to you, how you should apply it so you can be better Christians, and that's awesome. And we're, we're going to do kind of that today as well. But I want to do it just a little bit differently because... My, my big wrestling through this has been, so who, who are we preaching from? Like, are we, are we the eunuch? Are we, are we Philip? Are we, you know, the, you know are, we, are we the person driving the chariot? Like, who and where are we in this passage? Where is God calling Mercy Springs? So here, here's what I want to do. I'm just going to kind of read it, and we're going to kind of go through it and, and talk about what this has to do, what it says. In 26, it says, an angel of the Lord, then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go south towards the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. We, we often skip over these first words in, in scripture because for us, they're just, um, the words that kind of tie things together, but they don't, they don't mean a lot to us. So we simply move on into the passage because we want to get into the meat of scripture, right? We want to know what this part says to us. But when we see a word like then, That means that this is a sequence, right? That there's a story. I did this, then this. That this is a part of some sequential act that happened. And if it's a part of a sequential act, then to understand the context of this, of how it works, we need to understand, like, what is happening here? What is this then? What is this next step to? 
And so what happens before this? What is it that is happening? And, and just really quickly, in Acts 8, beginning in verse 4, it says, Now those who were scattered went from place to place, proclaiming the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. So here's Philip. He goes down to Samaria, and he says, I'm going to go proclaim the Messiah to the people in Samaria, in Samaria, right? Like, we're going to go talk about Jesus to them, tell them about Jesus. We're going to see how this works. This is how any ministry goes. Hey, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to share the gospel. Hey, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to share the gospel. So we're going to see how this goes. So he goes down, Philip goes down to the city of Samaria, proclaims the Messiah to them, and the crowds with one accord listened eagerly to what was said by Philip, hearing and seeing signs that he did. This is good stuff. This is like every evangelist's dream, right? This is every preacher's dream. I'm going to go share the word of the Lord, and people are eagerly going to come and listen to it. That's good stuff right there. We love that. So the people eagerly come they, with one accord. They're all, hey, let's listen. This is good stuff. So they're listening to what he says, and, and, and they're seeing signs that he did, and unclean, um, unclean spirits crying with loud shrieks came, out, shrieks came out of many who were possessed and many others who were paralyzed or lame or cured. So there was great joy in the city. So revival is happening over here in the city, right? Like, or not just revival, like Bible, because they haven't had it before, right? So I, 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 I know I made up a word there, right? They're, they're, they're bringing Jesus. People are getting excited. They're listening. They're following. They're seeing things happening. This is good stuff. This is the goal, right? This is what we want. Am I right? I hope. I don't know. Maybe, maybe some of you agree. Okay, so this is what we want. This ministry is going well. And when you're ministering, when you're a pastor, when you're an evangelist, whatever ministry you do, whether it be the, the children's ministry, the youth ministry, whether you're, you're going out to Dia de los Niños, it doesn't matter what you're doing. When you do it and a bunch of people come and are changed and transformed by this work, what happens? You get excited. You're like, yeah. Woo! Good stuff. The Lord moved. We did great things. Praise God. I love it. That's awesome. And we want to do more. And we get excited about those things, don't we? We want that. That's the goal. I'm not going to lie. That's the goal for me. I love to come up and see the Lord do amazing things. This ministry was going so well, in fact, that it says in verse 14, that word gets out and the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God. So they sent Peter and John to join them. So, like, the work that they're doing there, this ministry is going so good, the apostles hear about it. Dude, the bosses at corporate heard about it. They're sending the CEOs. Like, they're coming to see this great work that they're doing. So, they're going down there like, we're here. Hi, I'm Peter, John. Probably heard about us. We're the guy that made that guy dance. Yep. That's us. Walk with Jesus. Totally. Yep. No, no autographs. We're the man. Right? They're there to come see what's happening. This is a big deal. This ministry is just, it's taking names. This is an exciting thriving ministry. We all like those, don't we? So here's Philip in the middle of this amazing ministry that he's helped to, to bring about. And it says, then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go towards the south to that road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he's basically telling Philip, Go from this thriving, exciting ministry to a wilderness road that is isolated and seemingly lifeless. Huh? Philip goes from a place of successful ministry to an isolated place with little hope of success. I, I bring this up because it's so important that in ministry... Ministry is under the direction of God and not us. Amen. We're to listen to the Lord, to follow God, to serve where God calls us to serve and how God calls us to serve. And, and it's important to remember that it's not about advancing our career, right? It's not even about our personal satisfaction. It's about others. And, and I know we all get that. I, I know we can say that, but we struggle with that. We all do. We struggle with making ministry about me. I'll say, okay, how does this make me look? How, how am I feeling? Do people recognize the hard work that I've done and where I'm at in this? And, and we all wrestle with our egos, with our need of self-affirmation um, from others. And because of this, when we do this stuff, it's really difficult for us sometimes to listen to God because look, I can do that, God. But if I do that, no one's gonna notice. If I do that, that's not what I want. I want this spot. I want this place here because if I do this ministry, it's so great, it's so wonderful. This is the good stuff. I wanna be the quarterback on the football team because that's the dude that everybody loves. That's the person that gets the praise. 
And it becomes difficult in ministry. It becomes difficult from any position to recognize it's not about us. And to at least to, to practice that. It can be hard because we can often find ourselves even comparing ourselves with others or what it is that we personally desire. Here's what they're doing. Here's what we should be doing. And, and using other people as a litmus test to our success in ministry. They, they saved this many people. How many have we saved? They've done this many outreach programs. How many have we done? They have this many people in their morning attendance. How many do we have? And, and we do mark it. Let's be honest, especially in attendance. It's one of the biggest things that we do. How many people showed up for church? We could tell by that how good they are. I literally had a pastor tell me, you can tell a person how good a person is as a minister of the Lord by how many people are there. I thought, are you sure about that? He said, I got to tell you, there are a whole lot of people who followed Hitler, and I don't think that that's really a good measure of what's right or wrong. Ministry is not about comparing ourselves with others. It's not even about what we personally desire. It's about commitment. And it's about commitment that even we, we, we struggle with, for example, in marriage. Right? I'm committed to you in the sense of I'm not going to cheat on you, but are we committed to people to allow them to be who they are the way they're supposed to be and to follow them and to encourage them? And the same thing for ministry. I'm committed to God, Lord. I'm not going to cheat on you. I'm not going to go worship at some other temple. I'm not going to claim another thing. I'm going to be a Christian forever. I'm only going to be a Christian. Uh, I'll, I'll, never, you know, I'll never do one of those other things. And we call that commitment. I'll even show up to church once in a while. But we don't actually mean commitment in the sense of I'm committed to whatever it is that you want, God. And that's the commitment he calls us to. God doesn't call us to a commitment to say, I'm not going to worship other gods. He calls us to a commitment to all the way to follow him where he leads. And sometimes where he leads is crazy. I mean, it got so crazy that people who were actually slaves in Egypt get freed from slavery. And then the path that God takes them on, they're like, this guy is so crazy. I would rather go back to being a slave. Like, it seemed so much nicer there. We had leeks and onions. And to be fair, it wasn't that bad. They only whipped us once in a while. Then, the, yes, they killed some of our kids. But you know what? It happens. It's not as bad as this crazy God dragging me through the desert, wanting me to do this and do that. And I don't know where he's at. And then Moses disappears in the mountains for days. And who knows what's going on? I don't want to be that committed to God. But ministry requires this absolute commitment to God wherever and however he leads us. And this is where Philip's at. So what happens? He calls Philip. He says, hey, you got this wonderful ministry. It's awesome. Leave. I want you to go over there. There's nothing going on. And so what happens? He got up and went. He got up and went. And now there's this Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had to come to Jerusalem to worship. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading from the prophet Isaiah. Now check this out. So Philip gets up and goes. This is how we're supposed to do things. When God calls you, we get up and we go. I'm going to go do what God calls us to do. He gets up, he goes to this isolated road where he encounters an Ethiopian eunuch on his way back to Ethiopia after coming all this way to worship God. Now, I want us to understand a few things about this person that Philip goes to see. When we went to, um, when I took my first real mission trip uh, out, of, out of country, we went to, to Africa. And um, in, in um, Malawi, where we went, one of the Sundays, we went out to a worship and to, to go uh, do a dedication of a well that the, the New Mexico district had, you know, had, had bought and, and purchased for over there. And, you know, that, that part is what it is. But to drive out there. So we had to get up early, get on a bus, and we're driving out there. And this was like... I want to say the best part of this road was about like driving on the Santa Fe grade. How many of y'all ever driven on the Santa Fe grade up there, right? Yeah, like here's what you do on the Santa Fe grade. First off, you never drive your vehicle because <laughs> it's going to die. And I always, always want to do this is just take a bottle of milk and put some chocolate powder in it and just hold it because driving down the road is going to shake it up, right? So this is, this is good stuff. So that's, this is the road, right? And, and so we go out there and we're driving for hours down this dirt road in the middle of nowhere to this teeny village. It looks like it's got like just four or five huts and that's it. And this little teeny church that has a roof structure on it. Um, there were the, actually the four sides were there, but no windows and no doors. 
right? So it was all open there. You go in and there's a dirt floor. As we're pulling up, I, I want to say a hundred or more people come out of this teeny building that is a three quarters of the size of this sanctuary. Come running out, excited to see us. And, and, and then they're singing and dancing. They're already, and I'm like, are we late for church? They're like, well, officially it doesn't start for another hour. But they always get here hours early and start the pre-worship worship. I'm like, all right. So they're early, they're worshiping. And I'm like, great, we're late. I hate, if you guys know me, I hate being late. If you're not 30 minutes early to something, you're late. Okay? Like, like, that's me. Like, I cannot stand being late. So I'm like, we're late. They've already started. We go in, and they're singing and saying, come on in. And they're like, well, while they're still going and clapping and dancing. And we go in there, and, and they start doing the pre-worship. I'm not even sure when worship actually started because it was just happening. And they're getting it on, worshiping the Lord. I'm thinking, this is the most amazing thing ever. And then, and, and so we do this. There's, the, there's, um, um, you know, there's a sermon, but there's song, and there's dance, and it's just this amazing thing. And I'm thinking, you know, and, and, and well, this is a special occasion. We're dedicating a well, and we have visitors coming from America. So surely this is like a special occasion kind of thing, right? And it turns out, no, no. This is their every Sunday. These people get up super early, walk miles. They walk kilo, kilometers because we're in Africa, right? Not America, right? So they walk kilometers and kilometers to get to church early so they can worship God and do this amazing thing. They hang out afterwards. Like for them, this is the event. They're eager to worship the Lord. And they walk distances to get there. And I remember afterwards, you know, talking to some of them and they're like, oh, it must be so wonderful to be in America. We could learn so much from you. And I remember looking at the first person who said that to me and said, no, no, I don't think you could learn a single thing from us. If anything, I think we would hinder you. What we need is for you to come show us how to worship God. Because let me tell you, in America, it's church starts at 11. If I get up at 1030, I won't have to listen to announcements of the first few songs. I can just get there just before the sermon starts. If I go, right? And I'm not going to go, why? Eh, I got this going on. I got this going on. We, we and, and I, I hate to say it, one of the things that I love the most about America is our freedoms to do things, especially to worship. But because we, every person in here was born with that right, none of us fought for it. Like, we've had that right. It's just it's something that we assume is there. We take it for granted, and we're like, yeah, whatever. If I go, I go. If not, not. God can be happy with it. And so we're not excited to worship the Lord. So here's this Ethiopian. This Ethiopian eunuch leaves his country, Ethiopia. This isn't a driving from Dos Palos to, 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 to here. And I've actually had people tell me, like, Pastor, I don't go on Sundays because I have to drive from Dos Palos to get there. Hate to do that on a Sunday morning. Hey, I get it. That's so horribly inconvenient. This dude actually gets up from Ethiopia, hops in a chariot to go worship God in Jerusalem. Now, I don't know if you know how long that is. That's 1,500 miles, over 1,500 miles to go to church. And he's not taking an Uber. He's not flying. This guy's in a chariot. And when you're, when you're cruising along like this, you, you might get 20 miles a day on the road, which means he went 75 days in advance at least to make it there. I can't stand driving 20 minutes to church. How about 75 days? Like, I'm not going to lie. Look, I'm not, I'm not saying we should be that guy because I'm not going to lie. I would probably check out at about two hours. Actually, I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm being generous. I'd probably check out more than that. I'm, 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 right? I'm quicker than that. I'd be like an hour drive, a uh, half hour drive. I get it. I get it. 75 days in advance to go to Jerusalem to worship God and then to go back 75 days again. It's 150 days of travel to worship God. How many are down? Yeah, I'm not even going to pretend to raise my hand because you know I'm not. This person is excited to worship the Lord. And, and, and listen to this, not just excited. This is a court official. So, so this person is traveling over there. Um, he, he has his own copy of the scriptures. He can probably afford to make this trip because he works for the queen and the treasury. You know, and so this has got to be what, like six months vacation time he's got to take to go do this? 
right? A couple months and a half there, a couple months and a half back, a little bit of time being there. Um, he's educated. He spent a great deal of time probably reading the Word of God. But here's the thing. He's not your typical Jew. He's an Ethiopian. And, and in this world, in this time, Ethiopia is, is the fringes of the known world. This is 1,500 miles away. And he looks different enough, even just his physical appearance looks different enough that he's called out in the very name of his nation. Because Ethiopia means a land of a people with burnt faces. Because this person is black. He looks this way. He looks different. And so even the Bible says, here is this person from this land of people with burnt faces. He looks different from them. He's not just a foreigner. He's obviously a foreigner. He's obviously not a typical Jew. And more than that, he's a eunuch. And for those who don't know, that means that he's been castrated. And and being a Gentile, which is what he would be, that's one thing. To be a Gentile person who converts or who becomes a follower of God, that's one thing. That allows me certain privileges. I'm not full Jew because I wasn't born into it, but I can get right up there and I can participate pretty good in my worship being a follower of God. I can be proselytized into this sect. I can follow this. I can go through this. I can even be circumcised into this this group and be sealed and marked as the people of God. I can be baptized into into Judaism if I'm a normal Gentile. But this person has been castrated. He's a eunuch. Which means that his ability to worship God is really hindered. You see, Deuteronomy teaches us and tells them that no one who is emasculated or has his male organ cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. So this eunuch travels 1,500 miles, 75 days, to go worship God, knowing that he's not just going to be a second-rate kind of worshiper of God in the assembly, but even further down than that, his worship is so limited because he's a eunuch. He could never fully participate in the worship of this God, Yahweh. He could never be a full Jew or a member of the assembly, the body of God, what we might call the church. His identity and his situation prevented him from being a full part of his people. I wonder how many today feel that way. Because I know that I struggled with this feeling, like I could never really be a full part of the church because I wasn't raised in the church. I didn't have my parents run the church. And I've had a lot of people make me feel that way, like, yeah, you're welcome to come here, but you don't really know our ways. You don't know how it is. We were raised here. My parents are charter members, so you need to kind of just, you're welcome to be here, but back off. We got it running. I was made to feel that way in churches. And I know that today, that happens to a lot of people. I see it. And not even at the church level. I've seen it on our district, at the district level. Like you, you're welcome to come and join us, but you'll, and, and we love you, we do, we're all going to be in heaven one day together, but right now you're second rate, you're not exactly one of us. You're welcome to come up, but you can only come that far. These are for the charter members. These positions here that we have, these are for other people. This worship coming this close to God, that's for them. You can't be a part of that. Look, it's not, it's okay, God has great, we love you the same, you just can't be the same. And I wonder how many people feel this way, it's so many different levels of church. And to be fair, many times the full members of the church we make sure that other people know that they're second-rate members. And this is such a heartbreaking and, and absolutely, I don't want to say evil, but definitely counter to the gospel idea. This Ethiopian eunuch knew that his place was limited. But he still found it important to be as involved and integrated into the assembly as he could. I think we could learn a lot just from that. See, even when you feel outcasted, I want to encourage you to fight for your spot in the community. I'm going to tell you that right now. You belong here. You belong where God calls you, and don't let anyone stop you. I've seen people try to stop my people and say, yeah, you can't because of this or because you're a woman or whatever. I'm going to tell you, don't let anyone stop you. And if they do, let me know. I'll go to bat for you. You belong here. Then the Spirit said to Philip in verse 29, 
Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the, the prophet Isaiah, and he asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. The Holy Spirit sends Philip to this Ethiopian eunuch. He doesn't tell the eunuch to go to Philip. He sends Philip to walk with him. Did you catch that? Philip's already a successful evangelist. Philip is a successful pastor. Philip is doing some really great work. He's got proof over there. His work is so great that the higher up CEOs of the corporate church, whatever you want to call it, the apostles themselves, the we walked with Jesus men, went to go check out his work. I'm that Philip. And that Philip doesn't tell the eunuch, well, you come to me and I'll help you. He goes to the eunuch and then he walks with him on his path. Because ours is not to sit here and wait for others to come or to meet certain requirements before they can be a part of this. Ours is to go to others and to walk with them on their road where they are at. And that's scary and that's difficult. And this eunuch is certainly knowledgeable about the scriptures. This eunuch is certainly educated, has read it, knows a lot about it. This eunuch could easily probably have taught Philip some things. After all, Philip was a Greek converted to this. Like, what do you know, Philip? I was raised in this way. I've been studying it forever. Dedicated, I'm so dedicated. I just drove 1,500 miles to go worship God. I've been reading the scriptures. Got my own book here. Or my own scrolls. But this eunuch who's knowledgeable about the scripture, when Philip, a stranger, asks him if he understands... He doesn't allow himself to be offended. How dare you try to question me if I understand? Instead, he responds with humility, and then he invites Philip to join him in his space. See, we need, when people come to us, to, to show humility and invite them into our space. Because regardless of how long or how well we've studied God's word, we must always be humble enough to recognize that we need continuous guidance. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to slaughter. Like a lamb silent before its shear, so he did not op- does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak and started with the scriptures, with this scripture he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. Philip explains to this foreigner, to this foreign Ethiopian eunuch, that this passage about injustice to an individual is about Messiah. It's about Jesus. It's about his God, his creator, his savior about how this God became flesh and made himself subject to humiliation, made himself subject to marginalization. He made himself subject to being outcast and treated unjustly. He shared the good news about how this Jesus would also fulfill God's promise that he made through the prophet Isaiah specifically to someone like this eunuch in in chapter 56 when he says, do not let the foreigner joined to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from my people. And do not let the eunuch say, I'm just a dry tree. In other words, to the prophet Isaiah, this book that this eunuch's already reading, the same prophet says, look, a lot of you are going to say, I don't belong to the Lord. I'm never going to be a part of this family. The eunuch's going to say, look, I have nothing to do. I'm a dry tree because I am not capable, because I'm, I'm, I'm sexually distorted. I'm never capable of being a part of this heritage, of this lineage, of what God is doing. I'm forever cast off. And God says to this prophet, you tell the people that the Lord, that Yahweh says to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my wall a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And this is a message of hope that speaks directly to this person. This is what it means. He offers him the gospel. He offers him good news. We so often think, well, the gospel, the good news has to be the thing that's good news to us. 
It's good news. And yes, the good news that we have, the good news that we've learned, that through Christ there's eternal life in his presence, that's great news. That's awesome news. To this eunuch, that would have been great news too. But the real good news to this eunuch is that I don't have to worship this God that I love, that I'm dedicated to as a third-rate citizen. He's going to make me a monument, bring me inside of his wall, say, right here, you're one of my people. That's good news. He offers him the good news that through Jesus, there's full restoration into the people of God. And no previous conditions would prevent this foreigner, this eunuch, from fully participating in the worship of the Lord his God. Which is why he can say as they were going along the road, they came across the water. And the eunuch says, look, here's water, finally. What is to prevent me from being baptized? My existence, my life, my race, the things that were done to me, everything has prevented me from being a full part of the people of God. But now because of Jesus, now that you've told me this, I know has gone. So what prevents me now? You should tell me. What prevents me from being baptized, from becoming fully the people of God. His marginalization and and his stigma in society, they couldn't prevent this. They can't prevent his marginalization because this is the gospel. See, this is the message that we need to be sharing with this world. And I know I I probably sound like I'm just beating a dead horse or like I keep beating the same drum. But we're not called to be a people to go out into the streets and and just walk up to people and say, hey, do you know Jesus is Lord and Savior? If you died today, would you go to heaven or hell? Because that's not what this book teaches. The gospel of Christ is beyond that. It's eternal and it's now. He says, here's the good news. You've been marginalized. You've been stigmatized. Whatever it is that's happened, whether it's your fault or somebody else's fault, it doesn't matter because this guy, this Messiah, this isn't just some Messiah. This is the very God who in the beginning spoke. This is the very God whose spirit hovered over the waters. This is the very God who became incarnate and brought heaven to earth. So everywhere that he came, he brought restoration. That God, that God ripped open the heavens so that we would have forever this thing where heaven touches earth so that forever we could come into this. That God has promised that he's coming back, but right now that God has sent us to give you the good news that there is restoration right now and you're not going to be some second rate citizen. You're going to come in, you're going to sit up front because we're going to put you up front because we've been waiting for you. These seats at the table, there's lots of room and we lament every day that you're not here, but when you come, we're going to have a homecoming and just like the prodigal son, we're going to put the best jacket on you, we're going to give you the best ring, we're going to kill the best calf, we're probably going to have some green chili enchiladas I'm just saying because that's proof that we love you. And we're going to bring you in here. We're going to love you. And you're going to be a part of this equal with us. Never with this condition of you're lesser than us. You have to earn your place because none of us have earned it. We're just here sharing the good news of the gospel of Christ. That's it. But that is overwhelming. Because on our own, we're just Adam's in this huge mass of rock. But by the Spirit and by coming together collectively, we're formed into that mass. We're formed being built on the cornerstone that is Christ, the temple of God. We are the people of God. And there are so many more that need to come and be a part of it, not just for their sake, but for ours, because none of us is complete without them. I want to invite the team to come back up. And I want to leave you with this this thought. What if, what if we were a people who were both Philip and the eunuch? What if we recognize that we all, every one of us are Gentiles who come into this, who are grafted into this amazing tree 
This amazing, relentless God who has called us to be a part of his royal priesthood. And then we, what if we, we got excited about this? And we're willing to do whatever it took to worship God, to be there at every single moment, every opportunity to be the people of God, to strengthen, to recognize that worshiping God isn't some right that we have but it is the fulfillment of who we are. That, that if we were to follow the heart of God, then we could be real. And, and what if also, like Philip, we're willing to go out into this world and share that and go wherever it takes? Saying that sometimes, you know what, maybe my ministry isn't this wonderful thing here that everyone's looking at, but my ministry is this wonderful thing out here on this lonely road in the wilderness for one person who feels marginalized. Because that entire mass of rock is built one atom at a time. It may not seem like it matters to anyone, but you know the old adage, it matters to that one person. I want us to seek that, to be that, to be that people who'd say, I'm going to do whatever it takes out of this love to reach others and to help them to see and to know the good news, the gospel of Christ. That he is the God and the Savior. That he is our Messiah. And that through him there is restoration, life, beyond anything we could imagine. So Father, bless us. And fill us with your presence. Convict us, Lord to chase after you wherever you lead us, however you lead us. Forgive us, Father, for seeking this, this Lion of Judah and expecting a violent, oppressive God, but rather to recognize that your wild heart, Father, seeks to love and to restore and to gather. That while you are good, Lord, you are powerful. have good planned for each of us so let us seek that let us lean into your wild heart let us be your people and let us serve you however you call us with great joy and enthusiasm we pray this in the name of our risen lord and savior jesus christ